cool. So yeah, today is not the world's most difficult lecture. It's just a bunch of examples, I would say. I want to talk to you about computer science outside of kind of what we've been talking about. Computer science outside of computer science. Computer science and other disciplines, maybe majors that you have, things that you're studying. How does computer science uh, add value to other disciplines, other fields of study? Let's get started with that. So I guess the idea is that like nobody's just going around and making turtle programs all day long, right? They're making fancy things. They're making, uh, they're making Canvas. They're making PowerPoint. Things that are helping not just computer scientists, but students, teachers, etc., etc., working professionals. So yeah, depending, regardless of your field, there's a computer program that somebody really cares about, right? If you're an engineer, maybe it's AutoCAD. Uh, if you're a teacher, maybe it's Canvas. But computer science is affecting all of those fields, right? So let's, let's learn a little bit about how computer science is affecting a couple different just generic topics. Let's first talk about social science and art. And I think I'd like to start this with a question for you. So please get into peer instruction groups, say hello, say happy Halloween, exchange costume ideas, and go to the Writ Nice page. My question for you is, let me clear it all out. Maybe it's just that right now. Let me clear it all out, but take a few minutes to think about some examples of computer science, just like programs that you might use, uh, websites you might go to, in the area of social sciences and art, right? I think we've talked a little bit about art specifically, but see if you can come up with some more ideas. Social science and art, maybe that's your, maybe those are uh, one of your majors. Your major is included in that phrase. What is important? What, what kind of computer science is helpful there? How has computer science been used to help this field, help these fields? Okay, I'll come up with a few examples, then we'll talk. And then I have some examples too. Thinking outside of Turtle Land. One more minute or so.
All right. That is my little timer. Let's take a look at what we're thinking. Boop. Social media, TikTok, Twitter. Yeah, a lot of academics like to post tweets. That's a, a good way to reach all of the people who like to read your research papers instead of waiting for like that long submit, make changes, publish cycle. So if you want to release some information really quickly, you can totally use social media. Is that our only idea? <laughs> We're a little confused on Halloween. Maybe we don't want to be here. But what's a big one that I talked about? It was Photoshop, right? Just suddenly now you can have, you have the ability to make art digitally, which definitely didn't happen without computers, right? They were required. That was a new feature based on now having computers in front of us. Cheap enough to buy and not take up a giant room. Does that make sense? What other examples were we thinking? Because I heard a lot of words, but I don't see a lot of text. Databases. What, you, what kind of databases? What do you mean by that? Any thoughts? Any, any ideas? I heard, definitely heard more words than I see here. At least as far as databases go, I think uh, when you're doing research, I guess, you would take all your data, put it in a nice place. I think that's, that's how I interpret the word databases. That would make sense. It could help you with your research goals. You can immediately see all your information in the blink of an eye. That makes sense to me. All right. So uh, I have another one of these questions next time. Uh, few slides. I expect a lot more participation from that one or I'm going to have to call on people. All right, so let's talk about social science and art. Here are some of my examples. First, let's talk about computational linguistics. Using computers to do linguistics stuff, too. like work with human speech or human languages. That is not computer languages anymore, human languages. So computational linguistics is essentially when you have a computer and you try to solve problems dealing with human languages, like recognizing speech. Siri, for example, is a great example of this, right? Siri, Google, whatever it is, Alexa, all those things, they need to recognize what you're trying to say as a human language, right? Coded in a programming language, a computer language, but dealing with human languages. So you have speech recognition, synthesis as well. After you've asked Siri to do something, Siri needs to tell you, oh yeah, cool, I just did that thing for you, or I need more information. And so the computer needs, needs to be able to talk back to you uh, using words that maybe uh, nobody's ever recorded before. It needs to be able to come up with speech, right? It needs to be able to say that random street name in Google Maps as you're driving, right? So it needs to be able to synthesize speech which is really cool. That's something computers have gotten pretty good at these days. All the TikTok videos with the speech synthesis, I think, are pretty convincing. Uh, but yeah, like the, the big deal, the big deal of computational ling linguistics uh, these days is trying to understand maybe spoken words or written words. Siri's doing this, definitely. It's called natural language processing, or NLP for short. I just took the first letters of those languages. So, yeah, the idea of NLP, I can read this blurb to you and then explain a bit more. The ultimate objective of NLP, that is natural language processing, is to read, decipher, understand, and make sense of the human languages in a manner that is valuable. So, for example, I need to be able to say, understand exactly what you're telling me to do if I'm Siri, and I need to be able to respond to your commands. 
with uh, either an answer if you're asking a question or you know, like set your timer or something or call mom whatever you're asking Siri to do it needs to know how to do it and this also pops up on the internet because a lot of websites that you go to these days right they ask you to do stuff or they pop up with this little human face text box which is not a human right even at like three in the morning this person's still there ready to help you type stuff into this text box and click it, click the button, and you will most likely uh, be taken to what you're asking about. That's na natural language processing all over again. It's essentially fancy searching, right? So yeah, computers have gotten really good these days at understanding what you want, taking your sentences that you type or that you say and getting information. So let me try and break down what natural language processing is doing. Let's, let's use Siri as an example. That's my favorite example. So if you say, hey Siri, set a timer for five minutes, let's try and break down what happens. Because Siri needs to do a lot of things. First of all, uh, Siri needs to hear your voice. It needs to wake up, maybe you press the button. But Siri is not getting this text, right? It's getting sounds. And it needs to understand that this text... Are, uh, it needs to generate this text from your voice, right? So it needs to first, the first step is going from voice to text. Taking whatever you say, maybe with an accent, and understanding that you you said exactly, hey Siri, these are all different words, where do different words begin? How do you differentiate similar, similarly sounding words? It's a hard problem. Hard problem in, a, in NLP. Set a timer for five minutes. So it looks like nothing happened. I just wrote the same thing again, but a huge thing has happened. We've translated sounds to text. That's the first step of Siri, right? That is very important, speech recognition. And that's a hard problem, but we've, we've done pretty well. We can solve that pretty well these days. So now we have this text, and Siri needs to take this text and understand what you're asking uh, Siri to do. So let me underline it in green. There's, I guess, the idea is that it's breaking down the sentence in a way that we kind of did in elementary school, right? Finding the verb, finding the object, trying to understand what's being asked of us, all right? So the first two words are kind of like the activation. So even if you didn't press a button, you can have Siri just listen for this. If you ever say, hey Siri, that is going to activate it, right? That's activation. So that makes Siri wake up and start listening for the rest of the sentence, right? And now that Siri has been activated, it needs to parse the rest of the sentence to figure out what you want done. So it needs to do that grade school thing of like, all right, set is the verb, uh, a timer is the object, it needs to break that down, uh, and then for five minutes. So there's some extra information depending on what you're asking Siri to do. So if you need to set a timer, you need to know for how long, so there's the duration. It needs to separate all of this in the sentence. You see how that is not trivial at all? You could have said it in a different way as well. Hey Siri, set a five minute timer. You would have to parse that as well in a different order. And Siri works with multiple languages. There's just a lot going on there. But after all this, Siri understands what you want. It understands what you want to do. You need to set something. You need to set a timer. Okay, I know how to do that. And oh, for how long? For five minutes. I understand exactly what you want. I'm going to go off and do it now. Okay, so that was a big jump from voice, just sounds, to text, to parsed text, where the meaning is figured out, and then finally to an action, to an action that you wanted Siri to do. Isn't that cool? That is natural language processing in a nutshell. There's a lot going on there. And then maybe Siri has to respond to you. Speech synthesis, right? Very cool. Any questions about that? Have you ever thought about all the complicated stuff that goes on when we ask Siri a question? All right. Well, let's keep on trucking. Uh, Let's next talk about human-computer interaction. Uh, this is a fun little subfield of computer science, and uh, it, it 
what's called studies, the interfaces between humans and computers. So that's the way that they interact, right? So helping create more interfaces that make sense. Because back in the day, right? Back in the day, all of our computers looked like this. They were just a bunch of text on a screen. They were, they looked exactly like this, essentially. Let me, oh no, is this ever gonna load? So yeah, this is what your computer used to look like. Just a bunch of text on a screen, and of course it's not even giving me text, but like, this is what you use, right? You scroll up and down, you have nothing but text to look at, and you can ask it to do stuff, tell you the day, the date, get a calendar. Oh shoot, that's not even there, really? That's funny. Stuff like that. And of course, uh, our grandparents don't want to figure out how to use that. We have gone a bit further, right? Human computer interaction researchers came up with the idea of windows. Graphical windows that you can move around on a screen with X buttons that you can click to close them that make it a lot easier for someone who doesn't really understand the inner workings of a computer to be able to use that computer, right? So we have human computer interaction researchers to thank for these ways to uh, use our computers. That's much easier than using a term, right? And uh, some of those interfaces work for non-humans as well, like you've seen plenty of cats using iPads and playing games, right? It's that intuitive. We have made interfaces that intuitive. Uh, and yeah, graphical user interfaces were uh, invented essentially by Xerox, the copier company, weird, weirdly enough. But the idea never went very far inside of Xerox land, so they showed their idea to Apple, who then made the first windowed stuff marketed to the masses. But yeah, even mice, mice, the graphical windows, we have, we have a copier company to thank, but it was the human computer interaction researchers who did it. And then, yeah, probably, this is pretty contentious these days, but maybe the next step after this is like virtual reality or augmented reality, but it's having a lot of trouble taking form, right? A lot of people are not liking Facebook very much, or Meta, whatever they're called these days, because they want to go really hard on that and nobody really wants it. But that could be the future. So recent advances, things like uh, augmented reality. Like Pokemon Go, if you ever played that, that's my fun example. And there's, a lot has to go on in this interface, right? You have to use the camera, the camera's working, and it's placing a Pokemon on the ground for you, so it needs to notice, like, okay, here's the horizon. Oop. A lot needs to go on computationally. It needs to figure out, like, okay, uh, based on the horizon, here is what the ground looks like. I can place something, like, here's the flat ground. I notice that it's flat, even. Uh, and then there's the thing right in front of me. So a lot needs to happen computationally there as well. You have to include the environment and place things in a logical way on top of the environment. So that's a complicated program, right? First it was text, now it's Windows, and now it's looking through your camera at the world and tapping on it with augmented reality. That's kind of cool. So yeah, that's, that's where things are going. That's like a combination of maybe social science and art. Any questions, comments about that? I just have a bunch of examples for us today. Not too bad, just to get us thinking. The next idea, uh, definitely art, would be music, right? Music production. So uh, all of electronic music is thanks to a computer, right? The very first uh, digital synthesizer was made by Yamaha, of all companies, back in the day. Uh, in 1974, and just everything's taken off since then. Now we have computers that are entire songs, right, that are generated thanks to a computer. Everybody is mixing their songs in computer software. Nobody's using tapes anymore these days unless they're hipsters or something. Everybody's using like Logic Pro, Ableton Live, all those things that maybe you've heard of, right? So there's even software that can make your instruments, your physical instruments sound like you went to a really expensive recording studio or you rented a very large concert hall, right? 
You just plug your guitar into a laptop and suddenly it sounds like it's like it was plugged into like a very, very expensive amplifier that I wish I owned. Right? That is possible these days, right? And there's even the idea of using machine learning based on previous recordings to figure out how to make the sounds more convincing coming from a computer, how to generate uh, sounds that match what is really going on in the world. Isn't that cool? So we have computers to thank there, and our lives are definitely a bit better because of it, right? I assume we all listen to music, at least some form, and it all goes through our computers. We didn't really think about that, and now we should. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? That's another thing that we should maybe think about using the tools that we're learning in this class. And then finally, we have, of course, art, uh, just art itself, digital art. Thanks to computers, now uh, everybody's making uh, art digitally. So here's a, like a quote that I found on the internet somewhere that I'm paraphrasing, like the best composers of our time are probably writing music for movies, right? Because that's where all the money is these days. Uh, you're not really making a, a ton if you just are a concert composer. So the best computer, the best composers are writing movie scores, and maybe the best artists of our time are just painting digitally in Photoshop. That's definitely a possible thing. So yeah, there's a, a bunch of talented artists, and I'm forcing you to look at them for your essay, right? That are just working only digitally. They're making uh, art for video games, for, um, for YouTube, for anything, right? And that, that's helping them make money, reach their entire uh, fan base. That's where the money is. That's where the artists will go. And this is 2D art, by the way. There's also the idea of 3D art. I'm sure you've heard of like Blender or other free program. That's a free program, by the way, where you can make anything. You can essentially sculpt digitally. If you press in on your tablet, like it takes a chunk out of the virtual play. It's super cool. But we can now do that with a computer. We can make 3D artwork. We can essentially sculpt with a computer. And that's how you'll make assets for games. Maybe if you've worked into game programming, you've used those or seen that idea before. Art has definitely made the jump to computers, and I'm sure we have a lot of animated movies that we're very fond of, and those are most likely all thanks to a computer, if they were at all recent. Any questions, comments about digital art, or just social science and art, plus computers? Isn't it fun? Exciting times that we live in. So yeah, just a bunch of examples today. Uh, I would like to switch gears to a, another topic, and that will be the, the second main one for today. Computers are also helping us uh, in a very concrete way. They're being used in medicine, right? And just in like hardcore science in general, chemistry, biology, all that kind of stuff. So uh, that's the next place that we're going, and I want you to think about that, all right? So please, as a group, uh, take some time to write down some examples of computer science in the medical field, in science. All right, maybe that's closer to our uh, our majors anyway. So please take a couple minutes to write down some examples of that, and that will get your brains working for my examples.
take another minute, please, to get your ideas in there, and then we'll talk about it. We know one bad example, but there are some good examples too, right? So yeah, let's see what we're thinking. What examples of computer science exist in the medical fields, in the scientific fields? What are we thinking? Do we have any good examples in our minds? Yeah, very nice. Thank you guys. So yeah, computer research and developing of medications. Yeah, that's a very, very recent thing, right? Uh, I'll talk a little bit about protein folding. Uh, maybe of this lecture, if not the end of this one, the next one, but computers are being used to develop medications that maybe not, might not have been able to be developed without the processing power that we have from a computer, which is really, really cool. Uh, you can like simulate how molecules are going to interact with each other inside of a computer, and that just makes it so much easier to try a bunch of possibilities and develop a medicine. So that's a great idea, yeah. Technology used in surgery. Yeah, computers are controlling surgery these days, especially things that are very complicated, like on the eye, that you don't want a shaky hand of a surgeon to mess up, right? So yeah, things are done electronically. You can plug it in. I'm sure there's a little bit of machine learning involved, like, okay, here's the iris, here's the cornea, all those eye parts that I don't really remember. You can probably program a computer to differentiate those pretty well. Mark exactly where you want the laser to go, which is really cool, right? Computational biology, yeah, very nice group 24. Human genome mapping, that's something that I'll talk about in just a second, so that's great. Robotic surgery, yeah, all this stuff. Computers are really helping us, right? All that kind of stuff. Computers are helping us uh, understand ourselves, other animals better, uh, and make just surgery go smoother and more successful. Yeah. Robots as well. Group 28 is thinking about. Very nice. Surgery on a grape. Ooh. I vaguely remember that one. That's so cool. Eventually. Eventually we'll get there, right? And yeah, all doctors these days, it used to be like paper chart. Now they're all transitioning to... Uh, a lot of them don't like it as far as I've heard, but at least for data integrity purposes and keeping it around, maybe it's best that everybody's doing stuff on a computer these days. So yeah, very nice. Nice ideas, and a lot of those are ones that I will talk about. So let's get right into it. Any questions or comments about anything before that? Those are great ideas, great examples. Uh, the next step is take those ideas, ideas slash examples that you have in your mind, sorry, I can't speak on Halloween, uh, and see if you can determine, like, are those good? Are those ethically valid? Should a computer be performing surgery on somebody? Is that even a thing that should be happening? That's always a question that should be in your mind. So yeah, let's, uh, let's talk about one. I don't think anybody mentioned this, but a very, very popular use of a computer in science is for the weather. Weather forecast accuracy did not used to be as good as it is today, right? It was kind of like a shot in the dark trying to think about what's going to happen a week from now, but now it's pretty accurate. We can determine, okay, it's going to rain exactly in a week, and it most likely will, 
right? We can model the way that the uh, the atmosphere works. Right? We can model the atmosphere itself using fluid dynamics and thermodynamics equations. So we know the equations, we know the physics, and so we can predict, right? You just put, essentially, I'm not going to be able to draw 3D very well, very well, but uh, essentially the idea is you pretend that the environment centered around Fresno is a box, right? And you have a bunch of sensors on that box, like, okay, here's uh, West Fresno, here's the school, here's Clovis. You put a bunch of sensors that have temperature readings, pressure readings, all that kind of stuff. Wind speed directions. The wind's going that way over here, that way over here, this way over here, that way over here. You have all these sensors, and you're keeping track of all this information, and you can learn from it. Like, you can use, okay, pressure's like this over here, the, the wind's blowing like this over here. Uh, you can predict, like, this is time A. This is what the sensors are reading. You can predict what's going to happen at time B with enough fancy equations, right? Here's what the atmosphere centered around Fresno will look like. Pretend it's a box. The wind's going to blow this way instead, right? This way instead. The pressure is going to be a bit higher over here, lower over here. That's the idea. And eventually you can talk about rain and stuff like that. So, yeah, with enough sensors and enough fast computers, you can make very accurate predictions. And it's much better than a human could, ever, could have ever done, right? But. Uh, the farther into the future that you try to predict, like no weather forecast is trying to predict essentially a month from now, right? That's too far in the in the future. There's too many errors, right? Too much randomness, the butterfly effect, right? Everything compounds the farther in the future you try to predict. So the, the weather accuracy for tomorrow is probably very, very good, but the weather accuracy for two weeks from now is a little bit more fuzzy. Okay? That's the reason why. There's a bunch of errors that compound when you try to model this stuff. Okay? So, yeah. Uh, it's not the weather person's fault. It's the computer's fault these days, which is pretty nice. So, yeah, that's really fun. Uh, and it makes them for some very good computer science talk. Uh, another thing that's very near and dear to our hearts, right, is air quality. Air quality is pretty bad in the valley. Uh, you can forecast that just like you can forecast weather. Right? Similar concept. You just make uh, make a box. Here's what the air is going to look like. Let's predict how much uh, stuff is going to come out of the exhaust of cars. How much uh, the hot sun is going to create? What was it? Little tiny ozone particles that are bad for us to inhale. Stuff like that. Uh, you can you can predict all of this stuff with enough fancy computers. Uh, Thing about air quality forecasting is it's probably not as well made as weather forecasting because the little model that they're using, all the equations that they're using, can be thrown off by unprecedented things. Like I remember a couple years ago with the like the giant masses of wildfires that we had around here. Uh, the air quality forecast for like a day from now is supposed to be like, oh gosh. Like, their rating system doesn't go up much higher than, like, 300. It was, like, predicting the air quality is going to be, like, 1,000, which is super bad, apparently. Uh, and it never got to be that bad. But it was throwing the model off, those giant wildfires. Those were just so unprecedented. The computer, like, didn't understand what was going to happen. Because they're trained, right? It's You can think of it as, as machine learning, and computers are trained to predict based on what's happened before. And doesn't really know what to do when something so unprecedented like this bad of air right next to us because of all of these wildfires just miraculously happening at once that was just too much for it overloaded it so yeah everything's getting better still day by day and then finally there's uh we can just go straight to fires wildfire simulations right the same idea you can predict and people are using computers the firefighters are using computers to predict the way that the fire is going to spread. So like, here's the map of the fire currently. You can predict, like, the wind's going to blow in this way, the fire is going to uh, expand over here. You can predict what the fire is going to look like tomorrow. Like it's going to expand in that way and that way, but not really this much over here, just a tiny bit. So like, the fire is going to look like this tomorrow, and this tomorrow, but only a little bit over here. So you can direct your efforts, right? Maybe we should drop some plain stuff over here and over here, we can kind of leave this one alone for today. Work on the the bigger spots 
the spots that are going to hurt us more if we don't deal with them right now. Okay? So that's really helping us keep people safe and just direct our resources. Any questions, ideas about that? These are fun little topics for me. This could be something you do as a, as a computer scientist if you're interested in the field. You could become a weather forecast, weather forecasting software writer. How cool is that? Another thing, uh, one thing that you guys talked about in your written ice page was genome sequencing, right? So this is really, really cool. Uh, computers definitely were necessary for this, right? So genome sequencing, by the way, is just taking human DNA, like all of our DNA, and writing it down exactly what it is, right? And so there's billions of, I honestly don't know how many, billions, maybe a trillions. I don't know what level, but a lot. There's a lot of base pairs that you need to write down. A, C, G, T, all those things, right? So somebody took the entire strand of human DNA, I'm not a biologist, and they, like, they read everything, every every base pair. This was an A, this was a T, just, this was a G, this was a C, this was an A. All that stuff for on, forever and ever and ever. And we definitely needed a computer for that, right? No human was going to look through a microscope at DNA and figure this stuff out, right? But we can make computers. Like it. It's really cool. So uh, a very, very cool thing happened in 2007. That was when we first completely, or essentially, with, some, with an asterisk, we completely sequenced the entire human genome. So all of human, uh, a particular human's DNA. We sequenced it back in 2007, and that was a huge, huge win for computer scientists and engineers. They work together, right? You had to build the machine that also reads it and then uh, some fancy algorithms that write down the sequence. But, oh man, that was very, I wasn't very, uh, I guess I wasn't around, I wasn't conscious enough of this idea at the time. I wasn't alive at this time, but uh, I don't think I was, it was really in the forefront of my mind, but it was a huge deal. It was a huge deal back in 2007 for this to have happened. And that was really cool. Uh, and that leads us to, like, this This was this took a lot of money back in 2007, but uh, some things are a bit cheaper to do. And so a company called 23andMe, maybe you've heard of them, they also started in 2007. Has anybody done it? Because I sure haven't. And it's supposed to be really cool. Gives you some very interesting information. I'll have to try it one of these days. Uh, but... Yeah, 23andMe, if you've never heard of that, uh, they originally started testing your DNA. They took some, uh, like a swab of something, you sent it into them, and then they would tell you about your ancestry, like based on the ancestry of people's DNA that they have already collected. They'd tell you, like, okay, um, here's a map of places in the world, like, okay. A lot of us are of European descent, for example, like here's a map of Europe. It like gives you a map and it shows you like, okay, you have DNA from here, from here, from here, from here, from here, and here's Africa. Some DNA from here and here and here. And it shows you your ancestry, which is really cool. Um, and now also they test for diseases because uh, some, some diseases are genetically based, right? And so that's another thing that they test. So they don't sequence your entire genome. That would be a lot of money, and that took a Herculean effort uh, to do it in 2007. What 23andMe does is they take your DNA, they unwind it or something somehow. Again, I'm not a biologist, but there's your DNA. And what they do is they search for markers, right? They have little pieces that they know about, and they see if those pieces exist in your DNA, and it's apparently cheap to figure this out. Maybe they have little DNA magnets or something. I'm not sure. But they have these little strips of DNA that they search for. It's like, okay, if you have this strip, it means you uh, are of Western European descent. If you have this other strip, it means you're of North African descent. Among other things, right? Stuff like that. If you have this marker, that means you are at risk for this particular genetic disease. And so that's a really cool thing to, to know about yourself. I'm interested in trying it one day, but I have not yet done it. 
But that's the idea. Computers can take your genetic information and search through it. How cool is that? Any questions, comments about that information? Those ideas. They're cool ideas. All right, this brings us into the realm of like surgery that we were, a lot of us talked about. Let's talk about robotic things, robotic appendages that we can put on a human and replace uh, maybe an amputated arm or something like that. That's my example, at least. So uh, if you want to learn more about this, I took this information, uh, this, in, this image from an article. Uh, and more recently, we made, in 2019, the first non-invasive robotic arm that only needed sensors, no invasive surgery. Everything was amazing. And you can control that arm. So uh, I'm not sure how familiar are with robotic appendages, but here is a nice picture that will teach us it. Okay, so there is the idea of, first of all, there's a difference between a prosthetic arm and a robotic arm. I need to teach you that, and then we'll talk about the new kind of fancy robotic arm, the technology, where it is today. Okay, so uh, if, let's pretend we have a, uh, just a body with an arm, with the arm still attached, if you want to move your arm, right, it's your brain that thinks that. Your brain thinks, I want to move my arm, and so it sends information to uh, the nerves in your arm, right? It makes it so that eventually that arm actually moves, right? That's how your brain is controlling everything. So there's some fancy acronyms that I don't know, but the motor cortex of your brain is going to help you move your arm. It's sending a signal down there all connected somehow, all right? Uh, if you have an amputated arm, then uh, you get a prosthesis, and what happens if you have a prosthetic arm is you are controlling your prosthetic arm through the nerves in your arm itself, okay? I hope that makes sense. So the brain still can use the motor cortex and send signals down to the arm. It's just... Uh, there isn't one down there anymore, but we can hook in. Surgeons can hook into the electrical impulses that are still coming down to the arm area. Okay? And that will move the prosthetic arm. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? So that's what it means to have a prosthetic arm. It means your brain can still send signals down to the arm area, and that can be used, those signals can be hooked into to move the prosthetic arm. So that's what a prosthetic arm is. A robotic arm is when you cannot send signals down to the arm area anymore. You have a, uh, a spinal cord that has some issues, okay? So the signals stop, right? And you cannot get information down to that area. Then, for, with a robotic arm, you hook into the brain itself. That's the difference between a prosthetic arm and a robotic arm. You hook into the brain itself with a robotic arm. You hook into the nerves at the arm area with a prosthetic arm, okay? I hope that makes enough sense. So the original kinds of robotic arms, of course, they would hook into the brain. Maybe you had to uh, do some surgery to attach some wires into the brain itself uh, to read that information, or you put some sensors. But uh, original robotic arms, uh, you have to read the signals from the brain, and the movements weren't the greatest. It says this could produce jerky movements, and so that wasn't... Uh, a very good deal for people with robotic arms, but more recently, people with damaged spinal cords can use the new technology that reads your signals from the brain again, but uh, you also don't need any uh, surgery, just on top of the head you can place some, some sensors. And with some fancy software, those signals can be translated into smooth movements of the robotic arm, which is really, really cool. And so people have unfortunately lost their arm, have a much better lease on life now that uh, this kind of thing is possible. Does that make enough sense? Any questions about that? That's amazing. And so this is just for anybody with a damaged spinal cord. Maybe you have your arm, but you can't move it. You can move this robotic arm instead. That's really cool. And this works for, of course, legs, other things. And 
Yeah, that's the power of a computer. Back in the day, that was just absolutely impossible. You need a computer, you need a little mini computer to control these robotic things, these robotic appendages that are going to make someone's life so much better. So it's really nice. This is definitely another win for computer science. Any questions, comments about that? Please correct me if you are a biologist and you know a bit more about the subject. I have a couple more examples for us. Let's keep trucking. So the next example is again near and dear to our hearts as Fresnans, uh, smart farms. So uh, we have a lot of agriculture around here, of course. A farmer can use computer science technology to have a better running farm, right? A farmer can put sensors around their fields to monitor the properties of their soils, so like here's their field. You can put a sensor in a bunch of different places, make sure everything is getting watered enough, the ground is wet but not too wet, all that kind of stuff. Measure the saltiness of the, of the earth, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and you can make that wireless. You can have a huge network of all these sensors just covering your farm, communicating the information to your house. You don't even have to walk outside. You can test the, uh, the acidity levels of your soil, all this cool stuff, right? Farmers love it. Everybody's connecting to the beacon on the top of your house or something. So that's one idea. Uh, another really cool idea, maybe you've heard of this, is... We don't have self-driving cars, but we sure have self-driving tractors. It's a much easier problem to solve, right? Uh, there's nobody to run into on the, on the field, right? It's your private field, first of all. You just program, okay, here are the corners of my field. Please drive the tractor in lines, uh, in these horizontal lines, please. And it all works out. Just turn around. And so, yeah. You can hook a GPS sensor to your tractor and have it stay within the, the bounds of your field and it can plow it for you, right? And you're not going to get sued because there's nobody to hit, right? It'll just go, go that way, go that way, go this way, go that way, and it'll figure it out. There's no traffic rules it has to obey, and it has those well-defined boundaries. And assuming nothing happens to GPS satellites, it's all going to work out just fine. So that's a very, very useful thing for farmers these days, just have a self-driving tractor. You can have your field plowed while you sleep. Isn't that cool? And then finally, just uh, kind of similarly to weather forecasting, you can use uh, machine learning, fancy big data terms, you can use fancy technology to make predictions about what's going to happen later. Like if your soil is this wet right now, uh, you, can, you can learn through machine learning how long your specific plot is going to take to drain that water and when you're going to need to water again to make it as efficient and cost-effective as possible for you and your farm. Isn't that cool? So yeah, because you have a ton of sensors, you can make better predictions and uh, essentially make more money as a farmer. Smart farms. Any questions about that? It's a really fun idea. One of the... Uh, there's some professor. There's at least one professor at Fresno State, and also one professor at UCSB, that uh, are working on this. They're researching into this kind of technology. All right, two last examples for the day, at least. And we'll do some more later. So, uh, I've talked about terrestrial issues so far. There's also outer space to talk about, right? Everything that we send, we have a bunch of satellites spinning around the Earth. All that stuff, like there's only a couple humans in space right now on the International Space Station, the rest is a bunch of computers, right? All talking to each other, making our lives so much better. GPS satellites, among other things. So here is the Earth, my best drawing of it. There's some continent, I don't know. But all of our space technology is made possible because of computers. We needed to program our lunar landers, all that cool stuff, right? Telescopes, for example. Uh, the Earth is moving, right? If you want to look at a star, it's way up here. Boop. You point your telescope at it, and then you kind of tell it to lock on because you know that the Earth is spinning, and so it better stay connected to this star so that you can get a good picture, right? There's a lot to worry about there. And you can have it focus, right? Your telescope can be programmed to focus on whatever you're trying to look at. 
uh, to account for the Earth moving, for the star moving even. Uh, there's that. There's satellites moving around, of course. Here's my best drawing of a satellite. Those are all floating around in space, and they are controlled. You can have a telescope on top of a satellite, right? That's a big one that was very recent. You can tell it to focus on a star and move around. But it's all being controlled by uh, some communication on Earth. It's all being programmed, right? The Mars rover, even. There's no humans on Mars, but there's computers on Mars. And we're telling it to do research for us. And it's, it's lasting pretty well, right? Any questions about any of that? And so we are gaining knowledge thanks to computers, especially uh, in the context of outer space. Space exploration and research. NASA hires a lot of computer scientists. If you're interested in working for the government, maybe NASA is That's a good idea. Isn't that cool? My last example is about medicine. So there is, uh, you know, the people, I think I talked to you about the people who made the Go machine learning program that learned how to play the, the game Go and beat a human, beat like a grandmaster or whatever they're called in that game. Uh, it was called AlphaGo. Uh, the same people made what's called AlphaFold, and they made a few versions of it. AlphaFold 2 was released in 2020, and it does what's called protein folding. It learns how to fold proteins using machine learning. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack in that idea, but uh, what protein folding is, is it's, uh, again, I'm not a, I'm sorry, I'm a computer scientist, not a biologist. But a protein is made up of a bunch of amino acids, right? I believe that's the correct statement. And with a bunch of amino acids in a chain, they're all connected to each other in a chain, uh, depending on which amino acids are where, those proteins, they fold in a weird three-dimensional way. And that way is uh, tells you exactly how it's going to interact with other things, with catalysts, with medicines, right? There's a structure on these proteins, the way that they fold. They're just a big, long strand of amino acids, but they look in, they look weird. They fold themselves in a weird three-dimensional way, and that, uh, that three-dimensional arrangement tells you a lot about how they interact with other proteins, with your body, things like that. And so if you want to make a medicine that targets something, uh, targets some type of protein, uh, you have to understand its structure. And predicting that structure is a very hard problem. All right? So that's the idea of proteins. They fold. And we would like to use machine learning to predict that structure. And somebody did it very well in 2020. Okay? So proteins fold in these weird three-dimensional shapes. Those shapes determine how they interact with other proteins. And for brand new chains of amino acids, for brand new proteins, it's very hard to determine which way they're going to fold. But... AlphaFold 2, their accuracy was ridiculously high. They did really, really well, like several percentage points, like several tens of percentage points better than any other competitor. Uh, and that's really, really nice, right? Their accuracy blew every other technique out of the water back in 2020. And that's going to help us help people. The better we can predict the way that a protein will fold, its shape, its three-dimensional shape, the better we can understand how cells work. Because what are cells but a bunch of proteins doing cool stuff, right? Interacting with each other. And that, on top of that, we can make medicines that target things, right? We can better understand how our bodies work, how, uh, how cells work, how proteins work, and hopefully cure some people along the way. And so that's a really, really great advancement that's quite recent. This, this is a very hard problem, and uh, they got really close to fully solving, which is really cool to think about. All right, We're learning the secrets of proteins with computers. They're just taking this random data. We, we fed it a lot of training data right, of proteins and how they fold, and it learned rules for how those uh, new proteins that it sees will fold that no human could have guessed. Really cool. 
Any questions, ideas about that? So yeah, in the back of your mind, I want you to be thinking like, is this all okay? Like, do we, do we rely a little too much? Not enough? What could we be doing? Uh, or if you're a computer science major, maybe you're a little bit biased. You want you want more computer science in all of these fields. But I want to give you some examples outside of like turtles and things of real programs being written by people. It's very important that you understand the, the threat of computer science, especially in this class. All right, yeah. So that, those are all my examples for the day. Are there any questions about anything that we talked about? Questions, comments? I have some more examples. Uh, we'll talk about crypto next time. I promise. That is something I cannot forget. And yeah, I'll talk, uh, because you had your extra credit be due last week, there will be a new extra credit assigned, but I'll talk to you about it next time. So that is all that I have for us today.